So I'll be making a presentation on um, uh, the state of food security amid the, uh, the, the, the COVID pandemic. Uh, basically just looking at uh, where we were before and what the challenges were and uh, what issues are now emerging as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. So just to begin with some a bit of background. So as you all know, the, the policy goal when it comes to food security in, in Kenya is that uh, the, you know, Kenya pursues a self-sufficiency objective. So meaning that uh, we would, the ideal, in an ideal scenario, we would be actually producing what we are consuming. Uh, and if you look at the targets that are now part of the big four uh, agenda, is that uh, the, the government uh, has a two-pronged approach, whereby we want to raise uh, food availability by increasing our production. And ultimately, this is supposed to make uh, food uh, affordable. And basically, this is based on the principles of that uh, in the Constitution and uh, Article 43, where the government, uh, you know, through the constitution guarantees uh, access to you know, safe and quality food. Uh, and access is not just production, but it's an issue about also being able to afford. And this is uh, especially for people in urban areas who are not involved in production. So for the rural people, uh, the, the, the core objective of the government is to make sure that people are able to make uh, enough money uh, and farming becomes profitable uh, to sustain their livelihoods. Um, and then for the urban consumers is that uh, food food should be affordable uh, given the, the average income that uh, people are making. Um, and this year, of course, you know that um, you know, it's not, but one of the things that makes it unique is the COVID-19. But uh, we know that uh, for us to talk about food security this year, we have to go like a, a one year back, looking at how did we uh, perform in the 2019-2020 cropping uh, year. And uh, we had a number of challenges, of course, with the weather, which is now becoming more and more usual as a result of the effects of climate change. Uh, um, and then, of course, from December, we had a locust invasion. And then now we have uh, a corona, the, the, the COVID-19 pandemic, which has actually disrupted uh, food supply, in as, uh, as well as causing threats to production. And of course, you know that beyond even the, the COVID pandemic, even after it has been contained, we'll still be, uh, having the effects, especially the economic effects as a result of the pandemic. So to begin with, uh, just a bit of context is that uh, Kenya, you know, we are a net importer of almost all the staple foods. And uh, I have some data here that I would like to share with you. Uh, the shaded area um, is the, the food consumption. So this is, remember that this is not the total consumption because, for example, you also have the non-food consumption. Uh, but for now, we're just looking, paying attention to the food consumption. And then uh, the, the dark blue bars are the, the, the production figures. Uh, and then the red line here is the average producer price. And then the green bars here, of course, are the net trade, which means that uh, the, the, the import minus the exports. Uh, so to begin with, you realize that for, for maize, of course, we, we know that uh, we are a net importer almost um, I think with the exception of about 2016, eh, that was the only time I think, this is coming now from the 2015 production year when we had a, a bit of good weather. Uh, for most of the years, we are, uh, usually have to import from the region to meet our food demand. And of course, this, this, the, the weather patterns have a huge effect on not just production, but also the prices. Uh, so like in the last shock we had was in 2017, where we had one of the highest uh, imports, uh, and this was mainly because of the high prices. Because again, uh, um, it's not just the, what affects our food production is not just the local production in Kenya, but also even what is produced in the region and also global. Uh, and then these are some projections, uh, on, and uh, what what we foresee is that uh, under the baseline scenario, which is if things remain as they are without uh, major changes. Uh, would still be a net importer uh, for maize. Eh? When you look at rice, rice, actually there are two key staples, rice and wheat, which we rely almost exclusively on, uh, on imports. And you can actually look at uh, the small bars here, which represents how much you produce. Uh, this is how much you consume. So you can actually see that this is, uh, most of what we consume actually is imported from uh, abroad. 
and uh, the price is not the price although we have this is the average producer price which is on the right side uh what what makes affects us a lot is not even the local producer price but also the, the, the global price because most of it most of what you're consuming is actually imported uh for irish potatoes um uh, again, the challenge for Irish potato again is the data, but uh, it looks like we are almost under outside key, where we just produce enough to, uh, to, to consume. But again, just to caution that um, the data here, uh, we do know that we import a lot of Irish potatoes from the region, especially Tanzania. But the problem is that uh, most of the data is not official. So we are not able to fully account for the imports. That's why you see that the next trade, sorry, the net trade for Irish potato is, is very small. This is just because you're not able to account for imports, although you know that they do exist. Uh, as I mentioned for wheat, again, wheat is another key commodity that we rely uh, a lot on, on importation. And um, what we've been seeing for wheat is that we, there's a spike in the local producer price. Again, this is just because of weather. But also noting that uh, wheat is mostly, most of the wheat growing areas, uh, wheat is also a substitute for maize. So depending on uh, previous experience, uh, farmers are able to switch between uh, wheat and maize. Uh, and a good example is that uh, like in 2018, uh, when we had uh, very poor maize prices, uh, in the following seasons, farmers uh, you know, shifted from maize to, to wheat. Uh, dairy, again, we see an, an, an emerging trend where by the consumption of milk, um, is growing as, of course, informed by uh, increase in population and also uh, more demand in the urban areas. And uh, the, the current state is that we, we foresee uh, an increase in consumption to the extent that unless we increase our milk production significantly, we are going to become a net importer. And actually, last year is one good example where there was a lot of noise about milk coming in uh, from Uganda. So in 2019-2020, in uh, we, uh, we started uh, the, the cropping season in March. Uh, and uh, one of the things that we started with was that uh, the focus was that we had the poor rainfall. If you remember, in fact, um, in many areas, farmers had to replant uh, because we had a late onset of the March, April, May. And then the rains were poorly distributed. And actually, if you look at uh, this right chart here, uh, normal rainfalls are considered to be between 100 to 130 uh, percent. That is what the Met consider to be uh, near near average. But you can actually see most of the areas are light green. Uh, so. Although the rains came much later and the kind of the season rebounded, when you compare with uh, the long-term average, and this actually, sorry, this is actually for the October, November rains, uh, but for between uh, May, April, May, and uh, June, July, August, um, the rains were very poorly distributed. And of course, we had uh, um, the cyclones in the Indian Ocean, and uh, we, we suffered some of the effects. Uh, and we also know that uh, the cyclones, like, what happened between uh, May to August are also credited with uh, the locust invasion. Uh, the, the crop recovered in the basket region, especially because of the, the good rains in October, November, December. Uh, and this rain actually started, uh, we had an early onset, but what also happened is that the rains were prolonged. We had uh, above average rain for, for the October, November rains. Uh, and this led to the rebound, and also not just for crops, but also for livestock. Um, and most of the country was able to receive uh, above average rainfall. And actually, this is now what is being shown in this uh, left hand side, uh, where you can see even places like Fukana who are receiving close to three times what they usually receive uh, in the long term average. But of course, one of the key challenges, of course, we remember, if you remember last year, was the, the flooding. Um, this happened between November and December. Uh, the ministry estimates that we lost about 10,000 uh, hectares of cropland. Um, we were not able to, I think there's no clear estimate on how much that would mean in terms of food stocks. But of course, 10,000 hectares is quite large. Uh, remember the landslides in a, a major uh, growing, I mean, like in West Pocot and in Central and other places in Rift Valley. 
uh, a lot of crop was submerged. And of course, the effect of this was that, of course, beyond just losing the, the cropland, even some places where the crops were submerged, you know, either the, the, the yields went down because of uh, destruction of the crops. Uh, and then this continued up to January and February this year. Uh, but the key thing is that what in, we realize is that for, for both the long range, because the heavy rains in October, November, December coincided with the harvesting period for the basket areas. So this again, there was a huge potential for losses, uh, especially due to harvesting during wet conditions. And also that prolonged into this year as well. So for, for the farmers in uh, central and lower eastern areas, uh, the, the prolonged rains in January and February this year actually coincided with a short rain harvest. So we actually did not see a lot of support in terms of uh, uh, support to help farmers dry, especially the grains. Um, and this we, 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 we hypothesize that you know, this year, if you look at in context, the, the, the post harvest losses uh, are likely to be much higher than we'd be seeing in uh, the normal uh, cropping years. Eh? But of course, it wasn't bad news for everybody. I think for, for the livestock growing areas, uh, the, the prolonged rainfall, especially from October to February this year, was good news. And uh, here I'm showing a chart by FuseNet. Uh, you can actually see that um, from last year, before the rains, the, the focus was that majority of the Asa and Zelia will have been in crisis. These are the the brown parts, eh? um, and this the, the, the yellow parts. Uh, it's not this, but uh, I think needs needs uh, monitoring to ensure that people can be helped in case of emergency. But because of the prolonged rain, the, the crisis was averted eh? uh, because uh, there was a lot of pasture regeneration and availability of water in the assets. Uh, so under normal conditions, if nothing else had happened, we would have expected that uh, production for both. Uh, dairy and meat, which are because most of the Asalele are pastoralists, would have actually gone up. And uh, people in these areas, uh, beyond just uh, being able to provide for their foods, uh, their, their incomes would have been uh, slightly better uh, compared to normal years. Uh, and then, of course, coming back to uh, the current focus is that uh, uh, the, the, the focus is that um, for this cropping season that we've just started, um, the, the focus has been that most of the areas, will, most of the crop growing areas uh, will receive above average rainfall. Uh, we had an early onset uh, from mid-February to, to March in most areas. And the prediction is that the distribution is going to be favorable for, for crop production. So the key challenge, of course, uh, that we see was that um, as a result of the prolonged rain, of course, we had a rebound in the, in the assets and the generation of pasture and water. But for the for the crop growing areas, one of the key things was that um, uh, there's high risk of uh, post harvest losses, and of course now for the cereals, I think the other challenge is when you talk about food safety and think about aflatoxins. Uh, but then also we, we also noted that um, the the lag between the seasons was too short. I think for most farmers, especially in the lower eastern areas, there was a a rush because under normal circumstances, rain would start in mid-March. And then this year, people were already planting by end of February. So trying to get the crop out and uh, making sure that you prepare the land and plant, replant for the new season, I think that, that was a big uh, push uh, for most of the farmers. Then, um, of course, we know that from December, we had the invasion of the, the, the desert locust invasion. And as I mentioned, part of the the, the cyclones that we experienced earlier in the year were credited to, to this. Uh, desert locusts, I think, were first reported in late December in Kenya. And um, in this chart, that this chart was for February, uh, you can already see that um, you know, the, the invasion had come deep uh, by, by towards the end of February. And uh, we were not just getting new swarms coming in from uh, uh, Ethiopia and Somali, but we also are having uh, hopper bands that were developing uh, within the country. Uh, by that period, I think 17 counties had already been affected and uh, the, 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 the color code is based on the period of infestation. So the, the red ones are people who, the counties that were infested by beginning of January. And then the green ones were the ones, the, 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 as, as the swarms were coming in, uh, this, they had less, less infestation, but of course you know that uh, 
the, the currently, when you look at the current forecast, um, is that uh, then you know, both Kenya and, and, and Ethiopia are classified as dangerous because of the new hopper bands. And uh, I think, as you all know, the, 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 the complexity of the locust is that, of course, one, you know that they, they are huge swamps. Um, I think the, the, an, an average swamp that has between 20 to 40 million uh, uh, insects, I think the, the, the estimation is that they would consume what uh, 35,000 people would consume in a day. Uh, and the challenge we have is also that uh, desert locusts tends to be highly adaptable to their environments and ecosystems. And um, the, the, the bands that are being formed within the country actually pose now a bigger threat because now they're adapted to the local conditions, uh, to the crop growing areas. So by the focus, the ministry has done a lot, uh, especially in, col in collaboration with uh, development partners uh, led by the FAO. Uh, I think uh, by in March, around 6, 000, uh, 600, sorry, um, NOS uh, servicemen were trained to undertake surveillance and to spray. Uh, in some cases, like what we're showing on the right hand side, are the traditional ways where people would dig a trench and uh, try to burn uh, the locust. But there's been a lot of uh, you know, use of agrochemicals, which has been the main control system. And I think uh, with the additional financial support, uh, the ministry is able now to mobilize um, mounted vehicle mounted sprayers, as well as undertaking uh, aerial surveillance. Uh, so the partners have been important for not just financial support, but also technical support. Uh, but then we also know that uh, there are some question marks in terms of what has been the effects so far. Uh, because we know that um, with the use of pesticides, I think it's not just the locusts that are being killed. So what is the, for example, the effect on biodiversity? Uh, and again, looking at the infestation of the desert locusts, given that most of it was on uh, assets which had registered um, improved pasture generation, what does that mean in terms of uh, loss of productivity, especially for, for livestock in terms of both um, uh, meats and milk? And then, of course, right now we know that with the new hopper bands, there's a threat to to uh, crop production areas uh, because now the locusts would be adaptable to move into areas that ordinarily they would not be able to move. And of, another challenge now has been, of course, the, the COVID-19 pandemic uh, because uh, logistics, especially uh, the distribution uh, of agrochemicals, most of the agrochemicals that we use are being imported from abroad. Uh, and this has actually been affected in the, by the, the lockdown of uh, airports and the slowdown in terms of uh, air travel. Uh, because mo right now, though we are receiving uh, cargo aeroplanes, I think the frequency is not as it used to be. So, and again, even once they come in, uh, the distribution again is being uh, curtailed by the measures that have been put in place to stop the spread of the COVID pandemic. So that, that uh, we know, that these are key question marks in terms of uh, more data is, be is needed to actually uh, help analyze these questions. But I think so far we know that although the efforts have been there, we've also encountered some challenges. Uh, and then this is the last chart from FAO, which kind of shows the, the forecast between now and the June. Uh, and actually you can see that the forecast is that uh, it's expected that um, there'll be significant increases in the swamp sizes. And this now is clearly, um, as we move to summer, uh, especially in the, in, the, in, the, in the Gulf and, uh, and uh, where most of the breeding takes place, uh, we, we, we see that um, there'll be need for concerted effort, not just within the country, but also within the region to try and uh, uh, um, bring down, especially the number of swarms, because as the swarms forms in also the other places, they're able to migrate. And remember, I think the, on average, this a, a swarm can do like 100 to 150 kilometers a day. So, um, you know, just the, the fact that they could be in Ethiopia means that they also pose a danger to them. So what we are seeing right now is that the, the, the danger, especially for the crop growing areas, is mainly because of the new bands, copper bands that are being uh, generated in the, in the, within the country. So the ministry has recently re released a, a food balance sheet, and I think the, the balance sheet shows that um, we are okay in terms of stocks. I think for most of the staples, it shows that uh, 
uh, we would uh, have enough balances until end of June. So the, 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 the key then is how do we, um, how does, if we have enough food stocks, how do we then ensure that our producers continue producing, but then also consumers are able to access uh, food. And I think this brings us to the next thing about the effects of the coronavirus, because uh, one of the things that coronavirus has done is to disrupt the food systems. So in the country, I think we would classify our major food supply system to two. Basically formal, where most of the food goes to supermarkets, grocery shops, and uh, the hospitality industry. Uh, and then the informal food systems, um, where you have a, a network of aggregators, wholesalers, retailers, and consumers. So under the formal food system, uh, we have emerging standards, not really standards that are cut across the board, but at least for the different actors, they try to come up with uh, uh, standards to accept the quality of food that they take. Uh, most of these uh, interactions are based on formal agreements. Uh, most, for example, people who supply uh, hotels and supermarkets, they are contracted to do so. And uh, it's easy to predict uh, demand and supply. Uh, but then formal food systems account for very little. I think they, they account for about 15% uh, of, of, of uh, the, the supply chain. Uh, most of the, especially the fresh produce, uh, moves through the informal systems, uh, where you have a, a huge network of people. Uh, there are no standards, and uh, supply and demand is not uh, predictable. And uh, the, the best example I can remember is that if you go back two years ago, in 2018, when we had one of the largest production, for example, of maize, you know, in Transoya, uh, farmers were complaining that they cannot find a market. Yet in neighboring Turkana, um, people were, you know, dying, no, not dying because there were no evidence of dying, but people were suffering from famine. Uh, and the market was unable to move food from Transoya to, 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 to Lodo, for example. But this is mainly because it's very difficult to, to, to predict uh, the supply the supply and demand under the informal system because it's mainly informal and there is it's actually difficult to try and bring order into that market uh, we have a number of innovations that have taken place especially in the food in the, in the in the informal food systems for example like trigger food which tries to reduce the number of players by moving food uh, directly from producers to retailers uh, and this actually tries to make sure that uh, they, they also try to bring standards and also to to try and um, guarantee both quality and quantities uh, to, to retailers and consumers. Uh, but then with the coming in of uh, the, the pandemic, one of the key things you've seen is the disruption whereby we know that initially when there was a, a, a ban, I mean, the, the, the curfew, uh, you know, even food transporters were not initially included. They were only included, I think, after like four or five days. And, and even then, uh, the, the interpretation, uh, I think, tends to differ by, by, by different police, police roadblocks on who they want to, to allow to pass. So we've seen that uh, for the formal systems, um, which mainly serves, of course, like in urban areas, uh, this would be serving the, the, middle, the, the middle income and high income households. There are a lot of innovations. Right now, uh, most supermarkets and grocery shops are doing uh, online deliveries where people do not necessarily need to go to the market. Uh, although in Nairobi, we've not seen uh, the closure of markets. I think in the peri-urban areas, we've seen uh, closure of markets. And actually, this now further disrupts the system because uh, most of the open-air markets are usually at the aggregate and wholesaler level. So by closing them out, actually, you are now kind of preventing the produce actually from getting to retailers. Um, so what, what we've seen, especially over the last uh, one month, is that you will notice that the prices of fresh produce has uh, been going up. But then this is not an indication of uh, lack of supply within the country because it's an indication of you know, the inefficiency within the supply system because uh, people are not able to enjoy time and place utility. So you, when you demand something, you cannot find it where you usually find it. So one of the key things that has really now affected the food supply chains, in especially in terms of access, is um, the measures uh, that have been put in place. And um, recently, when uh, 
the, the, the Minister for Agriculture released uh, the, the balance sheet among the key statements he said was that there is need to ensure that you know retailers, uh, transporters, uh, uh, the wholesalers are allowed to, to operate to make sure that uh, people can uh, consume food but uh, within uh, the reasonable measures that have been put in place uh, to help stop the, the pandemic. So the other key of course thing is to look at uh, and basically especially when you think about access is um, the, the prices and uh, here we're showing the trends in retail prices of course uh, across time you can see that 2018 um, there, there was a, a, a fall in prices especially because of uh, the good production and the excess stocks uh, from 2017 but importantly for us at this particular time is to look at the the period where we are like when you compare the trend for the month of January and February. Uh, so for May, you notice that on the left side, they have the wholesale prices. And then on the, le on the, on the right side, they have the retail prices. So for May, you, you notice that um, the retail prices follow the trend in, um, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the wholesale prices. And you can actually see that uh, the prices now are starting to, to go up. Uh, and if we can learn anything from the past, I think is to be able to predict what happens uh, in this period. And then when you look at the prices, for example, in February, uh, this is mainly because when you look at the wholesale prices, you notice that in February, the prices are going down. Uh, this is mainly as a result of the delayed harvest that was um, experienced um, in the 2019-2020 season, for both the, 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 especially for the long rain harvest. Uh, but then you notice that um, prices now are starting uh, to go up. But then this is, um, <clears throat> again, if you look at this together with the data from the ministry, uh, you realize that um, I think as farmers have been saying, I think one of the key challenges right now is ensuring that uh, produce is able to move from producers uh, through the supply chain to, to the consumers. Uh, this is the same for milk. Uh, milk seems to be a bit stable, but then when you look at uh, the, the prices for the month of January and February, then uh, you, started, you start seeing the shocks. And uh, of course, what we know is that um, compared, compared to last year, for example, right now we are paying slightly more for milk for both January and February. Um, and uh, as long as the, the market is not efficient, then we would expect that the prices would continue rising. So <clears throat> what, what we see as uh, both the effects of uh, the pandemic and also the effects of the locust and also the prolonged rainfall is that right now, especially as a result of the pandemic, uh, we expect to see changing consumption patterns. Uh, for, the, for the last one month, as people have been speculating on the measures that have been going to be put in place, um, I think you've seen that, especially in the urban areas, there's a high consumption of dry food, especially pulses and cereals. Uh, and this is mainly because of panic shopping, especially in the urban and middle income households. Uh, we don't think that um, this is happening for the low income households because of the, 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 the depressed demand uh, resulting from uh, you know, declining purchasing power. Uh, when people are being told to stay at home and they're not working, of course, they are, once their income starts declining, the, the, the purchasing power is likely to go down. Again, with the closure or the limited operations of restaurants and hotels in the urban area, uh, again, that, that is likely depressed demand. Uh, but then it kind of creates a shift because ideally, uh, when you think about it, uh, when people used to go to the office, uh, you will eat near a restaurant that is near the office. So probably right now you're still consuming the same at home. Um, but then now probably you're consuming something different. So you, you uh, and it's important to continue monitoring that. Uh, the, the, the social distancing rules um, have been a bit disruptive. Uh, especially for the fresh foods, uh, mainly fruits and vegetables. And actually, this is reflected in the rising prices. Uh, but I think it's also important to note here that uh, the, the rising prices do not necessarily mean that producers are getting paid more. Actually, to, on the contrary, they're actually being paid less because when you cannot uh, sell your food, then you have to get very low prices for that. So this, this is... Um, is a key challenge where by you find that producers most likely will get low prices and consumers will actually pay more uh, because of the inefficiency within the supply chain. Uh, and then, of course, for production, I think uh, there is expected dis disruption in the supply of uh, 
uh, inputs, uh, especially for high value produce like fruits, uh, veget fresh fresh produce and uh, dairy. And then also the price uncertainties that uh, producers are likely to face is likely to affect their investment decisions. Um, and then in the long term, um, I think we, we do expect that um, as a result of uh, the, the disruption in inputs, and it's not just inputs, we could also uh, talk about, for example, extension services, uh, people who are not, not necessarily going to talk to farmers because of the need to maintain social distance, uh, and probably trying to use other methods, which may not be as effective as the face-to-face -face interaction that farmers are using. So this is likely to to, to disrupt uh, the long-run production, and uh, the choices that people make in terms of uh, which uh, commodities uh, they will grow. And especially if you think about not just the cereals, but think about the the, the, the fresh produce and horticulture, uh, which take a bit short time to, to, to grow. Um, but but because of the disruption, people will be making uh, very different decisions that they have made under normal circumstances. Uh, then, of course, this is not because of the post-harvest losses, was because we expected that this year they were likely to be high because of the uh, harvesting during wet conditions. But one of the other things that we do expect is that uh, we are likely to have high food losses. And high food losses is because of the, the panic shopping. So if to, people are buying a lot of um, you know, dry foods, eh, but uh, who are they being sensitized on how they need to store them? Or um, because it doesn't necessarily mean that you know, the more you stock, then you're likely to consume. Actually, what happens is that the more people are stocking up, uh, and then you stock up expecting a shortage, then you realize that there's no shortage. Uh, and then I don't think a lot of people are efficient in terms of storage even at house of their own. So there is likely, there's a very high likelihood that uh, the food losses of course will also be high. Uh, and then of course, beyond the, beyond the pandemic, I think one of the key things of course is, uh, has already been predicted that uh, we are going to endure uh, an economic downturn. Uh, this means that because the, the, the people, 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 the economy is not performing well, so people are either not getting, especially in urban areas, people are not getting uh, the incomes that they are used to, or probably if they're getting incomes, they are getting lower incomes that uh, they would get. So this, of course, will definitely affect their demand. Um, a lot of people, we know that there's likely for people to actually being pulled back into poverty, especially because if you look at our poverty uh, profiles, we have a lot of people clustered near the poverty line. Um, and uh, for, especially for people who lose their, their incomes, of course, um, you know, they we actually need support uh, to be able to make sure that they, they are food secure. And then of course, the market volatility that we're experiencing, if it is allowed to prolong, then it's definitely going to affect production decisions and the decisions that uh, the producers will make in terms of what they need to, to produce. So um, in conclusion, I think there is need to enhance you know, you know, access to, 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 open, to the open air markets, especially in the, the urban areas. Uh, one of the things that we think can work is that you can reduce the number of traders and consumers, uh, but then allow the market to be open at all times so that uh, people do not necessarily have to feel that they, they need to buy everything today that they'll consume for the next two months. Uh, there is need also to continue supporting innovations. Already you've seen innovations like online shopping and cashless payments. I think this is also an opportunity that the government can use to try and bring order in the informal sector to make sure that uh, you're able to anticipate demand and uh, not necessarily formalize the sector, but you know, improve efficiency you know, within the informality. Um, there is need to support households, especially on uh, safe food storage, to make sure that, uh, again, people don't become sick because of poor storage, and also to try and reduce the food wasting, because right now we really need to make sure that we utilize the resources well. Uh, there is need to make sure that uh, you know, we continue to support our producers, both um, for crops and livestock produce product producers, uh, uh, to make sure that um, you know, as much as possible, um, we, we, we minimize uh, the, the effects this will have on production. And I think for those of you who have watched today's lunchtime news, eh, uh, I think there is an incident where uh, some people being ferried to work in a farm, uh, you know, they were arrested because of 
not maintaining social distance. So even that sensitization that, um, you know, how do we make sure that people are able to work, especially knowing that uh, most of our producers are not really mechanized. How do we really assist them to maintain the safe, um, safe, safe, maintaining the social, the, the safe distancing uh, rules, uh, uh, but not necessarily use that to become a hindrance to, to, to production. Uh, there is also need to make sure that, uh, especially uh, the ministry, to, to track both consumer and producer prices, because I think that is one key indicator of uh, inefficiency. By, by just looking at the producer and consumer prices, you can easily tell um, you know, where the market is actually failing and then provide incentives to, to help the market uh, operate efficiently. Uh, and one of the ways they can do this, of course, you could just think of just supplying market information, making sure that this is being uh, supplied to as many stakeholders as possible. And then, of course, after the pandemic, um, there will be need to help households, especially those who will have fallen into, uh, into poverty because of reduced incomes and they cannot uh, afford food, uh, to have safety net programs that can actually help them continue accessing safe and uh, uh, you know, nutritious food that they need to, uh, and actually as the way the, the government intends it in the, in the constitution, uh, that they'll guarantee uh, food security to, to all households. So we have uh, an, uh, a blog that we've written in this particular address, so you can find more information about what we're discussing there. And I'd like to stop here and thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Njagi, for that brilliant presentation. Uh, there are a couple of questions in the chat section. So I'll just start with one from um, Dr. Lucy Waruingi. She's interested in the monitoring reports of impacts of spraying on biodiversity. So she wants to know how can they get this kind of information. And then there's another one. So I'm gonna run through all the questions and then you can just answer them all at once. I think that's easier. And Antonio Cheng asks, uh, what is the extent of the impact of the agrochemicals, especially on birds? And how safe are the agrochemicals used um, on biodiversity. And then there's Leila. She's also asking the same thing as Anthony. How effective have the pesticides been in actually stopping the locust swarms? And if, it, and if ineffective, what would you suggest we do to prepare ourselves against a second invasion from copper bands? Mm -hmm. And then uh, Paula Kahumbu, still the same question. Do we know what pesticides are being used, amounts, locations, deaths, and is there any monitoring of impact on non-target species and on human health, residual pesticides in water and soil? Um, we have another one from Ian. He says he noticed um, a two-headed snake. So do you think the agrochemicals being used are slowly but surely rewriting the genetic makeup of organisms. And um, there's one from Karin. Is defense strategy still monolithic, concentrated on spraying toxic pesticides? How diversified are already the measurements against locusts? And um, Dominic Mutambu asked the same question again on the availability of data on pesticides being used says there are reports of uh, birds dying, particularly in Northern Kenya. Are the chemicals among the ones locally licensed by the PCPB? Are they approved or banned by biodiversity related conventions in Kenya, in, uh, in which Kenya is a party? He says there's an example of phenythrothion, which was recommended to be used, but it's banned by US EPA. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, for now you can answer that as I try and compile the rest of the questions. Yeah, I think, I think for the, round, the first round of questions, I think most of the, the questions are on uh, the, the, the impact, especially on the pesticides uh, or on biodiversity. And uh, I think for now, what we can say is that uh, just, before, uh, just before the, uh, the president, I think in mid-March, just before the announcement of people to start uh, 
uh, maintaining social distance and uh, encouraging those who are able to work at home to do that. Uh, there was a call by FAO actually for this particular purpose. And I think one of the things they were trying to do is to estimate the impact of the desert lockers, both uh, the effectiveness of the spraying, um, uh, and of course, of course, the, the, the effect it has on biodiversity. And I think there are news reports also that, you know, like I think in Isiolo, I think there's one news report about uh, the impact on untargeted species. Um, but I think that was not, did not, uh, to, my, to the best of my knowledge, that did not happen. So we, we do hope that um, as things normalize, um, this is one very useful study that actually needs to, to, to be done. Uh, and even as we are trying to cope with the new uh, swarms, I think uh, we need to explore all methods. I think from the initial literature, one of the most effective methods was surveillance because uh, the, the, the lockers give you like a four week window before they become airborne. And I think from the past literature, I think that was the best period to to control. Once they become airborne, it's, it's really difficult. Uh, but I think as, as, as the, uh, the, the number of people have asked, I think it's important to understand both the effectiveness of those chemicals. Uh, the, because I think right now that seems to be the main, um, main control method that is being used. Uh, and whether there is uh, potential for other other methods to be used uh, and, 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 and what would be the scale, for example, that now we need that would be able to recommend. Uh, but then on top of that, I think also there is need also to look at um, going forward, uh, the potential impacts both on uh, not just the biodiversity, but also uh, the economic losses. Uh, because right now the assumption is that, uh, you know, people in the Nordic counties are not it's like they didn't suffer. Nobody looks at it in terms of loss of livelihoods uh, and what this means for them. Uh, I think I like the question about the genetic makeup. I think that is, again, these are studies that I think once um, people are allowed now to, to work even minimally, I think these are some of the studies that need to be undertaken. Okay, great. Um, there's another one from Dominic. He asks, what about the impacts of COVID-19 and locusts on agrobiodiversity, especially the non-commercialized biodiversity, for example, wild fruits and game in the rangelands, where locust impact is high? Mm -hmm. And then there's a one that says, um, he'd like to know if Tegemeo Institute has undertaken any research on impacts of the desert locusts invasion to pastoralists in Kenya and specifically on livestock production and impacts on livelihoods. Mm -hmm. And then um, this is Morris he says, in Asia and Europe, mm -hmm. edible insects is the new food diversity mechanism. Instead mm -hmm. of spraying the insects, is it possible to model a framework where people could feed on them? Remember they contain more proteins mm -hmm. besides spraying might besides spraying might be detrimental to the environment could there be a cost benefit analysis for this locust inversion mm. um there's another one that talks about the exploring the option of mass harvesting of locusts since they've turned out to have some economic value to entrepreneurs mm. yeah so I think let me start from the reverse. I think for yeah the the, the potential of harvesting them. Uh, I think we've seen a number of people trying to do that. I think the only problem is that uh, there seems to be less information or less support to to encourage that. But definitely that is something that needs to be explored. Uh, uh, to Maurice's question, definitely that's true. Not just uh, I think there are a number of studies and Tegemeo has done a number of studies. Uh, the last one was done in 2015. Uh, that shows actually insects do contain more, uh, they are more important for nutrition, especially when you think about protein uh, and, uh, and uh, when you're trying to, to tackle the issue about nutrition, malnutrition. But the, the problem we have right now, of course, is, is uh, attitude. Uh, and uh, remember that when you talk about food security, is people have to be willing to, to consume uh, some of these foods. Uh, so what we know is that um, it's a cultural practice that has been dying. I think very few communities today uh, now 
you know, in 2020 uh, would feed on insects uh, as compared to like uh, 20 years ago when that was a practice with the white ants and uh, the termites. So this, this, this needs to be, uh, you know, both sensitization and uh, for people to understand uh, uh, the importance of that. Um, yeah, the, 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 the study on pastoralists, the, the impact on um, pastoralists and livelihoods, this is something that we intended to undertake. Uh, again, it was based on the, the call that was announced by FAO, but I think uh, we still hope that we'll be able to get to do this. Then uh, the last question I think was on, uh, on Dominic again, uh, talking about the impact of both the, the COVID and uh, the locust invasion on biodiversity. I think, as I explained earlier, I think um, some of these studies, we know they, 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 there was an initial plan to roll them out, but I think because of the safe distancing rules and uh, uh, trying to limit movement of people, some of these studies uh, were put on hold. So we really hope that uh, once uh, there's a minimal movement, uh, we could try and get back to undertake these studies. Great. There's a new question from Kevin Onyango. And Kevin says, with over 60% of urban dwellers residing in slums and riddled with high poverty and unemployment rates, mm. any strain on food access is likely to blow malnutrition to unbelievable scales, especially given what you've said about constrained supply of food, FFBS. Mm. What would you take on this and how can we have nutrition mainstreamed in the food security agenda, for especially in urban areas in the face of COVID-19. Um, there's also another one from Gabriel. How can we encourage indigenous knowledge of food preservation, such as sun drying, especially for farmers who are running losses due to limited markets? Yeah, yeah. How can the local farmers do this and meet the current hygienic standards to reduce further food insecurity and meet the demands amidst the COVID-19 pandemic? Dasi Ogada asks, has the biopesticide metahesium been registered for, has been registered by PCPB for use in Kenya? I think to Dasi's question, I think, uh, yeah, I'm not sure. I think this is something that we have to check. Yeah, yeah but I do agree. I do agree with Gabriel, especially about the issue about preservation. And I think, so one of the things we, we mentioned in the, in the conclusion is that there is need to support uh, producers, and this is one of the key supports that we can actually do, especially to fresh produce uh, and horticultural uh, farmers, because most of them, uh, if you remember, you know, two months ago, you know, we were talking about tomato being the gold, and I'm sure if you were to uh, to check, I think a number of, a number of farmers would have been attracted by the high prices of tomato. Uh, to grow tomatoes. So people who planted tomato in January, right now they're harvesting, but then the problem now is that how do they get to the market? Uh, so being able to help them preserve, uh, and also it's not just even at, at the farmer level, but even at household level, because I think being in a tropical country, in, in a tropical region, one of the challenges we suffer is uh, we have good weather throughout the year. So that, that means that our food preservation methods lag beyond people in the tropics who had to think about how to store food for a month or I mean for several months because they wouldn't grow anything during that period because of harsh climate. So right now for the knowledge that we do have, I think there's need to try and uh, package, uh, work even in the private sector to see what can be upscaled uh, and uh, try to move that knowledge to, to farmers. Uh, I think to the, the other question that Kevin mentioned is that, yeah, we do expect, especially when you think about nutrition, I think we do expect that that is one of the areas that uh, is gonna suffer. Uh, and when you think about urban areas, unfortunately, you have to think about extremes because now people are being forced to stay indoors. Of course, now you have the other extreme end where uh, people are likely to become obese. On the other end is where now you're talking about malnutrition because people are not accessing uh, the right food. Uh, but even for, 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 for that, one of the key things that we also mentioned in the conclusion is that the, the potential closure of markets, you know, basically just panics the market and panics both traders and consumers. But if you are guaranteed, for example, that markets would be open uh, and uh, people would be coming in. And, and I, I like that, you know, the, 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 the statement by, by the CS for agriculture 
was really this time trying to say that they will work with the Ministry of Health to ensure that you know, food is supplied, but within the most boundaries that uh, the Ministry of Health is instituting to help curb the spread of the virus. Uh, I think that is really important to make sure that uh, you know, food supply system is not as interrupted as we've seen. And then, of course, we also know that there is a, an informal barrier in terms of how uh, the roadblocks and how people interpret those foods. So there's need also to ensure that uh, those barriers are quickly dealt with. Uh, I think I remember seeing uh, like uh, in the, the, the first day the curfew was introduced in one of the roadblocks, they, were, they refused milk to be delivered. So that is a huge loss to the farmers. Uh, and of course, the, 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 the people who were waiting for that milk you know, would, would, would have a panic scenario where they think that milk is not going to be available. But that is not actually the true reflection of what is in the market. So the, the key thing is how do we quickly deal away with these artificial shortages uh, to make sure that uh, people can access. Yes, we are not saying that we should be uh, irresponsible, but let's, let's try to make sure that we don't panic. Uh, if there's a way that a market can operate with reduced traders and reduced consumers and uh, monitor that, I think that should be allowed to happen, especially for the low income households who will not necessarily do the online shopping like uh, the middle and high uh, income households. So those guys really need to access the market to access their food. So we should really find a way of making sure that those markets work and uh, support their, their access to food. Okay, um, that's great. There's a question from Darcy that said mm -hmm. if Metahesium is licensed. And uh, Dominic and Leila have just answered that question in the chat section. Mm -hmm. They say it is licensed under license number PCPBCR one two two nine in Kenya, and Leila has also provided a link there. So Darcy, if you can go there and just check the link, mm -hmm. uh, I hope it's helpful. There's a uh, two more questions from um, Kipto. Mm -hmm. he says, Daktari, do you think what's happening is a blessing in disguise in curbing food waste? And Kombo Katirimba asks, it's been many years since East Africa had a locust invasion. Is there a risk of another locust invasion in the future? Mm -hmm. um, Emmanuel Atamba also asks, how can we change how we generally deal with pests from killing pests to managing pests? Is it possible to implement integrated pest management practices? Um, yeah, I think, so in every, in every cloud, there must be a silver lining. And I think one of the silver linings we see in this situation we are in, I think uh, it's the issue about trying to bring some order in the informal food market system. I think, as we said at the beginning, um, most of our food actually goes through the informal system. But uh, we've suffered a lot because there are no standards, and this has also brought about a lot of food, food, food safety concerns. So beyond this, I think one of the opportunities that we do have is to try and see how we can um, uh, try to bring some order in terms of both standards. Uh, and right now, because of the challenges we have, it's not just standards in terms of how food you access the food, even how it is transported. Uh, because right now, the you, apart from maybe uh, innovations like trigger, you know, most of the food is just uh, you know, transported in open pickups, even the leafy vegetables, and that of course becomes a source of uh, uh, contamination. So I think we do have opportunities that even in this in this crisis, we can actually draw some lessons that we can use for for improving how we, uh, we how we do things in the informal, informal sector. I think for food waste, I think it's also another opportunity that we can actually not just, uh, this actually would go up to the household level to try and sensitize people on how to, to stop uh, and make sure that you preserve food so that we reduce the wastage. And the moment we do this, you know, if you're estimating that we lose about 30% a year on food losses, uh, we'd realize that we're actually food secure, if we can actually be able to uh, get over that wastage. Um, in terms of another potential locust invasion, I think a number of things happen for this kind of invasion that we're seeing right now to happen. Uh, and again, as, as you can tell, it's gonna, it, it, it's gonna take some time to, to to finish it, uh, because I think we may spend, uh, we are likely to spend the whole of this year you know, fighting the locust uh, before we can actually say we've got it to the scenario that we were before the, the invasion. But I think 
uh, to answer to your question is that this is basically a global effort. I think as you, you may have seen, is that the locusts are being reported to coming from as far as Yemen. And uh, we are not the only region that has been affected. I think the, the spread has also affected uh, Asian countries like Pakistan and India. Uh, so basically, I think the, the key thing when you look at it is that globally, we must come together to try and make sure that uh, the measures that were there before, the reason why we didn't see locusts for 70 years is not that because locusts are not there, but uh, the measures for control and surveillance were actually in place. So we need to ensure that uh, the, the collapse of those systems does not happen. Um, yeah, to the question uh, posed by, by Manuel, I think, yeah, I do agree with you. I think um, integrated pest management is actually key, uh, even moving forward. And I think we need to get to a point where we provide incentives uh, so that um, uh, people, it's easy, we make it easy to adapt uh, some of these practices, making sure that people have uh, uh, knowledge and information uh, on what they need to do. And I think right now we've seen uh, quite a number of um, interventions, especially on IPMs. Remember, for the last five years, we've been, we've been tackling different pests. Uh, of course, the following one was also another example where by it, it, it was clear that just spraying alone uh, does not necessarily control because it leads to other externalities. Uh, so making sure that we train farmers uh, and we have also a database where uh, and not just farmers, but extension, the whole network of extension service providers uh, promote this and make this to be part of the package that they do offer to farmers. I think that that would be very, very useful. Okay, um, the final two questions before we wrap up. Um, there's a question from uh, this minute, Maurice Osewe. He says, economically, can we conclude that COVID-19 lockdown enhances household savings or wastage, particularly in Kenya? And then Bill Yaya says, before considering the option of mass harvesting of locusts, do chemicals used to control locusts in Kenya have effects on human beings? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, so I think the... the, 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 the for the chemicals, I think that is easy to establish, especially once you know the chemicals that are. So remember that first, I think to the, to the best of our knowledge, that most of all the chemicals that we are using for control of the locusts, the desert, desert locusts are being imported. Eh? So I think one of, is to check the residual effect of some of these chemicals that we are using. And I think that that could be easily uh, established to make sure that uh, even before we say that yes, that they can be used for other uses, that we are not necessarily passing on uh, toxins uh, that would be uh, would have adverse effects uh, on other people, uh, and I think to Morris's question on uh, the savings, uh, I think ideally is not saving. I think it's basically a transfer. So, like the example I used initially, when people go to work, you would, you would uh, people would steal it. Uh, you would eat in a restaurant, uh, or in, in some cases, a few people. Would of course, carry back food. But um, right now, you're being forced to stay at home. So that means that you're actually now consuming uh, your food at home. Uh, so the key thing is, of course, there's some shift. But in terms of whether it's a saving or a wastage, I think it, behind, it really uh, is very much dependent on the behavior of, of, of the particular household. So my our initial assumption was that um, when you look at most of the, the urban areas, I think every time there was... Uh, potential. In fact, the best example is the day the, day the lockdown for Nairobi and other urban towns was, a, was, a, was a announced, the first thing that people did was to rush to supermarkets to, to stock up food. But the, the key thing is that when, it's, when that information is conveyed in a way that people understand that you're not necessarily being stopped from going to buy food, then you know it can help you make rational decisions. So if, if today uh, uh, my household consumes about 2 kgs of of maize flour per week. So if I buy 10 kgs, uh, depending on how I'm storing it, there's a very high likelihood that I'll throw away at least two to four kgs. Uh, because of course, the, 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 the flour will uh, acquire some sour taste and uh, probably as long as soon as I realize that I can buy, uh, I will go and buy fresh uh, flour. So, so the, the, the one that I'm, 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 I'm throwing away, this could be something that would have been consumed by another household. And then the other thing is that you create panic in the sense that it creates a notion that there's going to be a shortage when 
necessarily is, there's no shortage uh, because of the behavior. And then, so that ends up now being uh, disadvantaged for both other consumers because now we are fighting for the same resource. But then if you're assured that you, tomorrow you can get the same produce, and even if there's a delay, probably it's a reasonable delay, not like a one week delay. If it's a day or two delay because of the logistics, then that is something that people can work around it. But the, the key issue is that, again, the measure should not create a scenario of total unpredictability because that causes irrational behavior among consumers. Okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Njagi. Um, someone asks, is there any government officials or institutions on the webinar because they are responsible for implementation from the initial stages of this discussion? I'm not sure if there are any government officials on, the, on this call, but uh, this webinar is recorded, so we certainly can share with them. I'm sure team knows a number of them, so we can, we can share this with them. But um, thank you so much, Dr. Njagi, for your presentation and for taking time to answer the questions. This you. webinar has been recorded live, and I uh, will share the links to all of you who provided your email addresses in the, when you're registering. And kindly please fill in the, the poll uh, section at the bottom. We are carrying this forward as a series of webinars where we're just bringing on various uh, speakers and specialists on certain environmental issues. We will be having a next webinar next week on Wednesday. So please um, fill in the poll. Let us know what you'd like us to talk about or to bring specialists and, and talk about. And uh, yeah, we hope to see you in the next webinar. And thank you so much for joining. And thank you so much, Dr. Njagi. Thank you.